Darcy, and I'm here at the Seattle Aquarium right now, and very happy to be bringing you a hangout on air with one of our beach naturalists. I would like to introduce Marcy. Hi, Darcy. I'm Marcy. <laughs> hey, Marcy. It's Darcy over here in the other room at the Seattle Aquarium. And the reason we're here today is to share some information with everyone out there about our fabulous Beach Naturalist program. So why don't you start out and, Marcy, tell us a little bit about what is the Beach Naturalist program. So the Beach Naturalist program is one of the most amazing and free programs that you can enjoy if you're anywhere near the Puget Sound. We train a bunch of adult volunteers and a few children to come on the beaches at low tide, and we're on 11 different beaches, so depending on where you're coming from and, and uh, where, where your bus runs to, you can find us. And we cruise the beaches at low tide, educating, finding cool animals, exploring with the public, and really both helping people connect with beach animals and helping protect the beach animals, make it through what are sometimes amazingly low tides. And the beach naturals dress like me. You can find us on the beaches. Red hats, fancy vests, and good attitudes. That's right. That's right. I see you've got your, your beach naturalist garb. So you have your vest, those red hats. You can't miss them. So our beach naturalists are stationed out there, and all you have to do is get out there, and they are a wealth of information uh, about our local marine animals. And so actually, Marcy, I see that you've brought a few of those critters to introduce us to today. Can you tell us, uh, what do you have there? Well, today, um, we have a few creatures that people are seeing on the beaches right now. Yesterday, there was a low tide, and I got 25 or 30 questions just about these animals. So one of the creatures that really confuses people, I wanted you to know about, is this creature right here. So you can tell by looking at its shell that this is a really big snail. It's called a moon snail. And what's most impressive about it is that we generally don't see the creature itself, but instead we find the eggs it lays on the beach. And the eggs that the mama lays on the beach really look more than anything like a plunger. And people are constantly trying to clean up our beaches by collecting these egg cases, sometimes called egg collars. And so part of what beach naturalists do is we just let people know there are up to a half a million eggs still viable in this very rubbery, gaskety looking egg case. And the female has just laid it. She mixes the fertilized eggs with sand and with her own magical mucus, very slimy, really wonderful. And then she heads back under the sand where she hangs out. She's more comfortable. She can breathe and where she can eat and leaves dozens of these up on the sand for beachgoers like us to look at, to enjoy, and to not throw away. Yeah, even though it really looks like a piece of rubber, and if I didn't know any better, I would definitely think that that was not made by an animal. And actually, it is true that we don't see the moon snails all the time on top of the sand. Sometimes if we're lucky, we might find one. But what's another piece of evidence that we might find on the beach to know that those moon snails are around? Well, in order for the females in particular to grow so big and to lay so many egg cases, they have quite a voracious appetite. And one of their favorite foods are clams. And the way you will know you run into a clam that met its demise in the radula or the sharp drill-like tongue of a moon snail is you find a shell, a clam shell in particular, that really looks like it's been drilled by a jeweler just to beautifully fit on a necklace. But what we're looking at is a countersunk hole that the modified tongue of this particular snail has just drilled <clears throat> right into flopping the clam open and allowing the moon snail to just gorge itself on the clam. And we find these all over the beaches. So it's proof that they, the moon snails, while they may not be above sand, they are definitely all over under the sand, all over our Puget Sound beaches. So of course, even though it might make a perfect charm for a necklace, one of the reasons our beaches are so healthy is because we don't collect anything off of the beaches. We leave it there as habitat, as um, substrate for other eggs to attach to, and just to keep our beaches diverse and healthy. That's right. So even though people often like to collect shells on the beach, they might be tempted to do that because the shells look really cool. 
those animals need those shells. They're vitamins for the beach, they need those minerals, and they need the actual shells themselves for home. So really important reminder to just uh, look with our eyes and take only memories, leave only footprints on the beach. And I do see you've got a few other pretty cool critters there in our, our little portable aquarium. So uh, who else can you introduce us to, Marcy? Well, I don't want to handle the rest of these animals because even though I would be super gentle with them and my hands would be wet, it would still be stressful and I'd still be having a negative impact on them. And that is one of the great things that Beach Naturalists really help the public understand is how to interact with the animals without harming them. And so really getting down, looking at the animals and observing them. I always bring my binoculars, which I can kind of flip the opposite direction and use as a hand lens or a magnifying lens. Um, would really help me explore and examine these animals without stressing them out. So right here, I have a sea anemone, and there are a, a number of different species of sea anemones. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I will guarantee that you will see sea anemones if you meet a beach naturalist on one of our beaches. And they're fascinating animals. Essentially, they're upside down jellyfish. So everything we love about jellyfish is totally going on with the sea anemone, only the sea anemones don't float away. There's also a beautiful sea star here. Some people know them as starfish, which is totally fine. We call them sea stars just to make the distinction that they're invertebrates. They don't have vertebrae. They don't have backbones. They're not fish. And we also have a number of sea star species on our beaches, living, eating, enjoying, and finding safety in the habitat of our beaches. Very cool. And often, they have a pet worm that lives within their two feet, which is very cool. A lot of kids that come to our beaches have pets and understand that you really have to take good care of your pets and the sea stars really take quite good care of the worms that live with them. So that's something super fascinating. And then at the end of the tank here, there are some amazingly beautiful worms. I know land dwellers may not think of worms as beautiful, but when a segmented worm, like the earthworm that's recycling in your garden, when it evolves to live in the ocean, it becomes absolutely spectacularly beautiful and super interesting. So these feather duster worms make their own tubes that they live in, and when the water is out, they just suck into their tube and hang out and wait for the tide to come back in. But when the tide does come back in, they emerge from their tube and have this gorgeous feather duster-like appendage that serves many purposes feeding, breathing, they even have eye spots so they can detect danger and tuck back into their tubes, which is why I'm not going to pull them out now and sort of unnecessarily freak them out. But all of these things and more all over the healthy Puget Sound beaches. Yeah, it's a really good thing for us to think about when we're exploring the beach that if you kind of get down, crouch down and take the time and kind of slow yourself down, you're going to see some really cool and amazing animals on those beaches. So uh, I know that we also have some photographs that we wanted to share. We have a, a little mini slideshow, and so maybe let's share some of those photos, and Marcy, you can tell us a little bit about some of the animals that we got some, some nice pictures of here as well, so we can learn a, about a few more creatures that we might find on the beach. So this is a great photo, Darcy, that goes to what you were saying of if you slow down and you crouch down. Now, if this thing was the size of a dolphin, if this was like five foot boulder, everybody would see it. But the fact is, the, the creatures in this picture would all fit onto the palm of your hand. There's a cluster of barnacles, which are amazing crustaceans that molt just like crabs do. With their heads glued down, they feed with their feet. And anybody who's listening, I suggest you try that at dinner tonight, just to kind of see what the barnacles are up to. Then nestled amongst those white volcano-like barnacle shells, there's, they almost look like striped jelly donuts or jelly blobs. And those are a beautiful little lined anemone, yet another species from the ones that were in the tank that we were looking at a minute ago. And they're so little, maybe maximum an inch and a half. So it's really a treasure that if you start Bringing your focus down to the small critters, you're going to start seeing some really cool animals. And in the upper left, you see something that looks like a massive blue sail. That is a mussel shell. And mussels are like the original Spider-Man, shooting their bissel threads out so they can capture their enemies and secure themselves um, for whatever they want to do, whether it's just feeding or moving. Um, so that's how the mussels hang on. 
And so this little cluster here is all kinds of really cool animals. And there's also some algae. And I just want to say thank you, algae, for giving us air to breathe. So there's a whole lot going on on this really cool looking slide. And I know we have another shot here that uh, this is another one of those moon snail egg collars. So hundreds of thousands of little eggs, but that's not all. There's, there's something else all. going on there, too. That's right. It's a little bit naughty what's happening here. Is some of their cousins, these, the things that look like kind of brown blobs, are their cousins. Moon snails are mollusks. And nudibranchs, or dorids, the kind of sea slug animal that that brown blobby looking creature is, are also mollusks. And in this case, one mollusk is eating another mollusk. And it gets even crazier than that. The brown blobbies are called barnacle-eating dorids. And they do, in fact, eat barnacles, but that's not what they're doing on here. They are laying their eggs in those white, billowy ribbons, and then when they're done laying eggs, they can also take a snack and use their own scraping tongue, or radula, to get a few of those moon snail eggs out from the egg collar as a snack. And so there's a whole lot of mollusk happening on this one slide, and you will see this on the beach. That is, that is a cool little treasure trove. So let's see, we have a couple more, more photos here. Here's some good color, very beautiful purple sea stars. Those are some of my favorites. Gorgeous. So you can see that the sea star has five big juicy arms, but then it looks like maybe there's somebody else uh, kind of intertwangled in those arms. I see a few crab legs sticking out. It's hard to know exactly what's going on, but if I had to venture a guess, I would say this lucky purple sea star happened upon a crab molt. Now, crab molts are really common on our beaches, and at first they can really freak people out. People will come up to the beach naturalist often and say, why are there so many dead crabs on the beach? Well, the fact is, most of those things that look like dead crabs are in fact crab molts, which as opposed to being terrifying, why are the crabs dying, it's really quite uplifting that there's enough food and enough healthy environment that the crabs are growing. But like a snake shedding its skin, when a crab, with its exoskeleton, that hard shell, when it wants to grow larger, it needs to shed its old tight shell and grow a new one. And after it casts off its old shell, that old shell is called a molt. And that process of getting rid of your old shell is indeed called molting. And often, as with everything else on the beach, those molts will be reused, recycled, and um, and produce more vitamins for other creatures on the beach. So my guess is that that big, juicy sea star is in the process right now of recycling a crab mold that it's kind of mounted over, and it's probably got its stomach. The sea star has its stomach hanging out of its mouth, digesting that crab mold. So recycling in action right on the beach. That's a lot of action going on that uh, is you wouldn't even know if you didn't stop and look that the sea star is actually uh, digesting something with its stomach outside of its body, which is one of the really cool things about sea stars. So I think we have just a few more pictures to look at, and uh, there's some lucky beach visitors uh, checking out a sea star. And Marcy, it looks like they're really uh, taking that advice to look with their eyes and uh, leave, leave only their footprints and take only memories with them. Absolutely. My favorite creatures in this picture are the two little girls. And clearly, they have been taught well, and they are taking their time to observe. And the other thing I love about this picture is that I know that after this picture was taken, when the little girls left, they didn't run, because you can't really run with that much algae, that much seaweed covering the rocks. And by slowing it down, the algae does us all a favor. The girls have to walk slower. They're going to see far more beach animals. And in terms of going to the beach, just if I were to be emperor and have one wish, it would be that when people walk along the beach, they look down at where their feet are going. Not only will they see way more creatures and have a much better experience and appreciation of how healthy and diverse these beaches are, but also, as you put your foot down, try to step in sand. Not on algae and certainly not on eelgrass, because those two habitats are home to so many creatures who are hiding from the sun, from the low tide, from the predatory birds. And so by keeping our feet on sand, we can do our part to minimize any negative impact our feet would have on the beach. So these girls are really doing it right. That's great. 
So I think we have just a couple more pictures, and then I, I would like to get to uh, make sure we have time to talk about how people can know which beaches to go to and when those low tides are, because I know everyone really wants to know that information. Where can they go to see all this cool stuff? So again, uh, here we have one of our wonderful beach naturalists all decked out, and she's got her red hat on. And then we have uh, another one of our little critter friends. So that crab uh, looks pretty monstrous, but uh, probably one of those smaller shore crabs, I think. Absolutely. And this is one of the animals that, if it could speak human, I'm sure would really thank the Beach Naturalist Program. One of the things that we go out and teach school groups, teach families, teach all the beachgoers, is how to interact without ruining habitat. One of the first things people want to do is find animals on the beach. But if you were to go up to one of the big boulders where you suspect there's lots of these shore crabs hanging out underneath, to flip that rock over would be to destroy not only the animals themselves, but also a lot of habitat, a lot of homes. And so instead, being willing to just crouch down and peek under the rocks, not only have you earned the right to really peek into their home, but you've done it without a negative impact. And by changing our behavior a little, crouching down instead of rolling rocks, we do wonderful things for promoting the habitat of those purple shore crabs. And then there'll be lots more critters for all of us to enjoy the next time as well, and the critters will be happy and healthy. So how do we find out where to go, Marcy? When, when are the low tides? Where are the beach naturalists going to be? Tell us about how to find that information. Well, obviously, everybody watching this Google Hangout has a computer. And so that information is easily found. You can go to the Seattle Aquarium website and um, click on Beach Naturalist. And you have your choice of many beaches and many days. But in about a week and a half, there are some amazingly low tides coming up. We measure low tides around here by vertical feet. And the lowest tides of the year that you're going to get for the rest of the year 2013 are coming up at the end of this month. And so I really encourage you to go to a beach, dress for the beach, expect to get wet, expect to get thirsty, wear a hat, bring your binoculars if you have them, and the beach naturalists are really excited to meet you there. So um, any of those dates and any of those beaches will treat you right. And then look for those beach naturalists in the red hat. So, I have a few questions to ask you, Marcy. So we'll uh, we'll move into the Q and A portion of our hangout. And I'm curious, Marcy, what's the most memorable experience that you've had on one of our local beaches? Oh, you know, it's a hard question, Darcy. Let me think. So two days ago, I was at Golden Gardens, and one of the beach naturalists, it wasn't me, but one of the beach naturalists found a big skate, which is a cousin of a shark. It's one of these ancient fish that has no bones, has only cartilage, looks like a big manta ray. And she yelled for people, which is what we do, as opposed to bringing the animal around the beach, we could really injure and stress out the animal, we bring the people to the creature. And there ended up being this huge throng of admirers all around this big skate. And it was a fairly low tide and the water had gotten sort of depleted of oxygen and everybody just sort of stood sentinel and guarded the skate until enough water and cold, oxygenated water had come in, and the skate sort of flew, swam away. People applauded and loved it, and I thought, that is pretty great that all these amazing humans with college degrees are cheering for this ancient life form just because it lived through the low tide. And it was really a treat. It was really special, and everybody appreciated this animal without laying hands on it. It was pretty cool. So there are some bigger animals that we might find. Actually, a question that people do sometimes ask is, do we have any marine mammals that we might see on our beaches around here? And what if we do encounter one of those marine mammals? Absolutely. Never a season goes by that we don't see marine mammals. Often we see them out in the water, harbor seals. Even we saw uh, two pods of harbor porpoises feeding with the great blue herons about a week ago. But one of the ways that people get confused is if a marine mammal is up on the sand on the beach, people often assume it's been abandoned or it's injured. And the fact is that harbor seal mamas, even the best harbor seal mamas in the world, leave their pups to go and forage. And so in the natural scheme of things, we will see harbor seal pups on the beach. And the first thing we want to do is notify them, Marine Mammal Stranding Network, let them know there's a harbor seal here 
and we'll even take a picture and send it to them. We set up a perimeter and remind people that the best way to interact with this animal is from far away. Again, we don't want to stress them out. We're really visitors in their home, and we observe. It's another great reason to bring binoculars, and so you can feel like you've gotten a really good look without negatively impacting the animal, because if we were to take that animal home, it's going to be bad for us, bad for the animal, bad for the mom. If we observe it from a safe distance, it's great for us, it's great for the pup, and when the female comes back, she can continue lactating, nursing the animal, and and they have a nice, healthy population of harbor seals within That's Cuba. right. And here at the Seattle Aquarium, of course, we just opened our new harbor seal exhibit, so we all have harbor seals on the brain, and they are our most abundant marine mammal, so we have a very good chance to see them from our local beaches, as well as seeing them here at the aquarium, and they're one of my favorite animals. And I'm also wondering, Marcy, I know a question that people ask is, uh, can the animals at the beach hurt us? Is there anything that we should be worried about getting stung, poisonous animals, those, anything we should be worrying about there? Well, yes and no. The animals on the beach certainly wouldn't maliciously show any aggression towards us. We never get attacked on the beach. But on the other hand, it's a marine environment, and we're not truly marine creatures. And so I've seen kids slip on the beach. They can get cut from shells, slip on barnacles. And then there are also stinging animals. At the really low tides, there are often stranded jellyfish up on the beach. And the general rule of thumb in Puget Sound is that the darker the jellyfish is, the more intense the sting is. Again, that's really only true in Puget Sound. But we have some, what we call lion's mane jellyfish, that can get this beautiful, deep, sort of reddish maroon color. And they can get quite large. And if you were to go up and hug one, kiss one, lick one, pet one, I think that it can really hurt. And so I suggest we enjoy them without getting too physical with them. And then depending on how sensitive you are, you might have a reaction to a much milder clear or yellowish jellyfish as well. So my rule of thumb, oh, and the other thing is that if you scare a crab, it really has no other course of action but to try to pinch its way to defending itself. It can't say, you know, you're in my bubble space. Could you back off, please? And so it says that, but it says it with its pinchers. And so really my rule of thumb is enjoy it with your eyes and not so much with your hands or your tongue, as the case may be. Good advice, especially about not hugging and kissing the uh, lion's mane jelly. That's that's one I'll, I'll keep in mind. And so let's turn turn that around. And uh, what are some things that we can do to help protect the animals? Because of course, here at the aquarium, out there, the people exploring beaches, we have a lot of folks that love our beaches and and love those animals. But we want to be able to enjoy them without harming them. So what are your best tips? Well, I know this might sound surprising. Some people would say the best thing you could do for the animals is to stay off the beach, and I totally disagree. I think the best thing you can do for the animals is come to the beach, get to know the animals, observe the natural rhythm of the ecosystem, and do it in a way that isn't going to have a negative impact. So watch where you step. Be careful about the rocks, and share what you know with your friends. If you decide that you are going to touch something on the beach, like I touched the moon snail egg color. You always, always want to touch a marine thing with one wet finger. And the reason is that throughout the oceans of the world, marine creatures have a layer of this almost magical marine slime. And if we were to touch it with a dry hand, even gently, we could strip that kind of invisible cloak of protection. We could strip it off of them. And then they become very vulnerable to all kinds of things including just being smelled by predators. And so if you are going to touch, pick something up, a shell, a moon snail egg case, a sea star, for example, you would want to touch it gently, but with one wet finger. And so I encourage people to go to the beach and learn about the beach and appreciate the beach and be careful where you're stepping, what you're turning over, and how you're, how you're interacting. Those are all some great tips, Marcy, and I know uh, all of your colleagues in the Beach Naturalist Program are going to be out there sharing those same tips and encouraging everyone to get down to the beach this summer. Those of you who are watching who are in the Seattle area, I hope you will check out the Seattle Aquarium's website to find out the dates and the low tides and at any of your local beaches if you are going to explore everything that Marcy just shared. Is, those are all great pieces of advice, so take take time to look closely at the rocks and, and uh, 
explore with your eyes and you'll be pretty amazed, I think, at some of the critters that you'll, you'll find there. So we have a question from online. Oh, we do have a question from our uh, online viewers. So what is that question? What kind, of sea, what kind of sea stars do most people often see on the beach? So Marcy, what kind of sea stars can people expect to see on the beach? It's a great question. And it depends really on where on the beach you are. The smaller sea stars, some of the babies, juveniles of certain species like the purple sea stars and the mottled sea stars, some of them you'll even find clinging as they're growing out of their planktonic stage and into adulthood. You'll find them clinging to the moon snail egg collars. So that can be an extra bonus just by looking at the moon snail egg collars. Larger mottled stars or the purple pisaster stars really want to hang on to a bigger boulder. And I have a personal theory of why that is. You can agree or disagree, but I really think I've seen so many gulls swallowing huge sea stars, swallowing them whole, that I think the sea stars use their suction cup tube feet to grab onto boulders as a means of protecting themselves from being carried away and swallowed by the gulls. So the bigger the boulder, the bigger the sea star you can find there. And then, as a super bonus, at the really low tides, you start seeing some species of sea stars that are nearly subtidal, that almost never get exposed to air. So like the sunflower stars, which are amazing. They're like the sprinters of the sea stars. So those are our top three species that we see at the beach. Pisaster or purple, mottled, and sunflower stars. Great question. Great question. So we have another great question. What types of birds might you expect uh, during your visit to one of our local beaches? First of all, I love that somebody asked about birds. They're such an important part of our marine ecosystem. And we constantly are seeing osprey diving on the fish and great blue herons nailing the gunnels right off the beach. And we see crows and gulls digging up the heart cockles, which are the clams that live really close to the surface. And then they can't pry them open and they'll fly around looking for a way to crack that cockle open. So all I want to say is bald guys, Beware, I've seen plenty of cockles dropped on bald guys' heads and on rocks. So we see the crows, the gulls, the herons, the osprey, and at a few of our beaches, we reliably see bald eagles. So we really, we see kingfishers. We really have been so lucky. In fact, I think we've already seen a loon at one of our beaches this summer. So if you like birds, get your binoculars on and come to the beach, please. Yeah, I was going to say those binoculars are key, and you might be able to view some of those marine mammals that we talked about earlier from the beach as well, the harbor seals, porpoises, we have dolls and harbor porpoise, and maybe if you're really lucky, you might even see other types of marine mammals, like I believe a humpback whale was sighted from one of our local beaches by our beach naturalists during their training this year. That was very exciting. So Marcy, we are going to go ahead and wrap up our hangout. I want to thank you for sharing all your knowledge about the beaches and all your excitement and sharing all that information. I hope you have enjoyed hanging out with me here. Totally, Darcy, and I look forward to hanging out with you more on the beach. Me too. I am ready to go down to the beach and look for some little critters and big ones too, I hope. So thanks everyone for joining us here for the Seattle Aquarium's Beach Naturalist Hangout. And come back often to our Google Plus page because we're going to be doing lots more Hangouts, and I hope you can join us for those. Thanks, Marcy. Bye-bye. Thanks.